Welcome back, geology fans. We're about halfway up North Table Mountain, and we know we're past 64 million years old, as the lava flow below us dates to then. But how many thousands or millions of years have we walked so far? We glimpse exposures of cross-bedded Denver formation, often with younger colluvium above it in sharp contact. The Denver continues the story of the Rocky Mountains wearing down and depositing alluvium on their flanks. We are coming up to the cliff-forming units at the top of this mountain, but we need to pause to examine a few features observed before reaching these blocky units. First, we need to leave our usually traveled trail and jump all the way to the north side of this mountain. A study by Harold Drews in 2008 showed that a swath of basaltic rock enters the mountain at this location just below the cliff-forming units that cap the mountain. Being basalt, this represents another lava flow. And as with our previous lava flow, we see a U-shaped bottom and flat top, but unlike below, we don't have four channels entering the mountain, but only one. It looks as though one large river of lava flowed through this area after it had been buried to this height. When we get to the summit, we will look for the evidence that caused Harold to think the single lava channel following a stream bed only made it part way down this ancient stream and ceased before it could reach the south side of this mesa and even infer where that channel may have been. There is no evidence of any Denver formation between this second lava flow and the top cliff forming units. We see no evidence of this flow on the trail that we are now walking either, but just before our fourth stop on this hike, there is a layer of poorly sorted unit, both in size and lithology, from which you can get these small tourmaline crystals, which makes a geologist wonder. This looks a bit like a mud flow deposit, and a common occurrence with volcanic eruptions are mud flows known as lahars. And then directly on top of this sediment jumble is the next unit of hard, dark, resistant rock. The rock at stop 4 looks a lot like what we saw back at stop 2, which was a porphyritic basalt, or shoshonite. And a bit closer look, and yep, it's the same stuff. Another lava flow, and as below, we have cottonwood trees at the base. But unlike stop 2, there's no channel shape here. Rather, it's a continuous, thick layer. This is a flood basalt, or sheet flow, and like the one below, it can be dated. How much time have we hiked through in Denver Formation D World? This layer dates to 63, plus or minus 1.7 million years old. Superposition is still holding, though we have to note it does overlap with the first lava flow's date of 64.2 plus or minus 1.1 million years old. But assuming the middle values to be most likely and using the complex mathematics of subtraction, we've hiked up one to two million years of sediment deposition. And boy are my legs tired. When a basaltic sheet flow cools, it cools from the top down, and thus contracts from the top down. In the right cases, it can make very distinct columnar jointing. Pulling from relatively even space centers of contraction, the rock fractures from the top down in generally polygonous columns, following cooling patterns. Here, we see that the top of the Table Mountains has a columnar jointing pattern, but the joints are pretty far spaced and less distinct than some other cases. Now let's turn our attention back to those cottonwood trees, which need a steady supply of water. Since we don't usually see surficial flow here, it must be groundwater. But it's odd to think about the permeability of basalt. As a rock, it is absolutely impermeable to fluid flow. There may be some bubbles, vesicles, in the rock, but they're not interconnected, and so don't contribute to what we call effective porosity, and so will not transmit fluids. But this layer has been vertically fractured from top to bottom by columnar jointing, which means that this may have zero rock permeability, but high unit permeability. The rain that falls or snow that melts on these mountain tops can move through the cracks of the basalt with little resistance until it hits the underlying Denver formation, which we saw has enough clay to make it low in permeability. 
So water penetrating the basalt takes the path of least resistance, which means horizontally at the base of the basalt in a perched water table with springs along its margins, and so cottonwoods. The pattern repeats. The cottonwoods are also in the valley because it's a valley, and groundwater comes closest to the surface there. With all this information collected, it is time to move on, looking out for any unusual features as we go. At first glance, it looks like we will have this cliff-forming basalt all the way to the top. But what is this in the middle of the basalt? A unit of sedimentary conglomerate with a U-shaped bottom and a flat top of silty material? A stream channel in the middle of all this basalt. This isn't one single lava flow to the summit. There are at least two. A stream channel takes time to form at the surface, and the flow directly above buried that stream, whose water actually oxidized the base of that flow to a bright red that we can see here. I have also found pebbles above the grayish lava, which come directly out of the rock itself, which indicate there may be three lava flows up here, with the second being the smallest. But Dr. Drews, whose 2008 USGS report I mentioned before, which you can find online if you wish, suggests these might be weathering products from the third, lower lava flow. Though I'm still actively testing this, he does have weight to his ideas, as this basalt tends to show a pattern of decomposition called spheroidal weathering, which happens because chemical weathering acts most rapidly on surface-rich corners. Looking back at the conglomeratic stream channel, we see slight imbrication or shingling of the cobbles. This leaning of the cobbles indicates flow towards the Clear Creek Valley at that time. What time was that? Well, the lava flow below is around 63 to 62 million years old, and these upper flows also date to the same time. So this top flow is close on top of the other in geologic time, and we can only assign the same age all the way up to the top of this mountain. Looking back to the Denver Formation, we recall that it is only loosely consolidated, which makes it a landslide risk, but also says it was never buried too deeply. So any subsequent deposition after the top of these ultimate peak lava flows was not too extensive. It's mostly been wiped away, with only a few remnants left in spots on top of the Table Mountains. So as we approach the top of the mountain at 63 to 62 million years ago, we see our valley finally turning from the D-world we've been in so long. When we come back for our last episode exploring this mountain... It's going to be all E-World, from these younger Paleogene Age deposits to the present day.